Yes. Sir, what's the correct way of pronouncing your names, please? Um, Obinna. Chichuke. Anaba. 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 Yeah. Alright, um thank you so much for joining us. Out of over two hundred million people in Nigeria and billions of people in the world. What makes Obina different? I think it's, it's the uniqueness of, of my, my person, uh, which is um, the bringing together of my life experiences, my background, my education, my career, my uh, encounters and interventions in life that has created a persona that um, uh, gets into a crowd, and I'm there. Um, you may not be able to describe it, um, but you know you have a presence in the sun. Without saying a word, uh, people after the event say, who, who was that guy? You may not be able to describe it, uh, but there's something unique about me, which uh, in my life journey, in my work, and uh, in my encounters, uh, has come out. There's my perspective I bring to conversations. Um, there's, there's the unique, authentic nature of me uh, that cannot be ignored, if you, if you, if you don't mind. Um, if you pay attention, you will know I'm there. If we pay attention, we'll know you're there. This man with so many parts, how was growing up like for you? Um, very exciting. Uh, I come from a family of seven of us. I'm the first. Uh, my parents were teachers, uh, my mom was a headmistress, uh, my dad was also a headmaster. Um, so, so growing up was a community, um, six strong young boys and one sister. Uh, so the bonding was, was unique and authentic. Um, we didn't have much, but we lacked nothing uh, in, in the real sense. Um, the, the sense of contentment was, was, was um, was planted quite early. Uh, confidence in who you are, uh, authentic, being comfortable in your skin, uh, and also knowing that there's a world beyond you, that, that all of that was created by my parents. Uh, so we all grew up with that experience. Um, going to school was part of the expansion of, of the total being. Uh, so it was an exciting time. And the one thing that remains very unique, and that's part of my, my, my personalities. Being the first of this big family, as it were, uh, knowing where my father and my parents were coming from, uh, it was made very clear to me quite early that my margin of error was zero. Uh, success was, was a primary driver, so the motivation to succeed was planted. And it wasn't about you, it was you have to succeed because of more than yourself. Uh, that was why I had quite early. I left home at the age of nine to a boarding school. Um, back in those days, early 70s, people were just returning from the war. Um, people who had started secondary school and the war caught up with them, they went to fight and came back to finish. So those were the people I met in school. So you can imagine what that meant from a cultural man, from the worldview, from uh, uh, a tutelage standpoint. So we learned the good and the bad quite early. Um, so it's a miracle that we made it out of school. Uh, if I that way. So growing up was, was beautiful, was fun. There were various instances where it could have gone wrong, but we thank God we made it out. Yeah. So from the time of growing up until now, what have you been doing? Ah, uh, how do you answer that? Uh, of course, I went to school, um, um, secondary school, university, and um, um, I joined the company I worked for for 30 years, and that's Shell. Um, so my 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 adult life uh, is wired and tied together with 
my career in Shell. Because that's, you can say, that's actually the best part of my life. Uh, joining at about 28, 29, uh, and plugging through all the way to, to um, retiring last year, uh, August, um, by choice. Uh, so it's almost impossible to talk about what I've done uh, as an adult without talking about my career in Shell. In addition to that, I've done quite a number of other things which are non Shell, uh, which are non career. Uh, and all of that defined me. So let's talk about those other things that you do quickly before we go back into the business of a corporate life. Um, yeah, my, my, my background is, um, is religious. My maternal grandfather was an Anglican priest. And my paternal grandfather was a priest in the traditional African religion, so you can see. I'm a grandson of priests uh, on both sides, so I'm covered. Uh, <laughs> So, so, so that makes me, um, I take religion seriously. Um, so being born an Anglican, uh, I've remained an Anglican. I am a chorister in the Anglican church up till now. I enjoyed my church music. Um, uh, so growing up, going to an Anglican school, there's hardly any hymn and psalm uh, that you will bring up. And I, I wouldn't have an idea how it is sung, the harmony and the melody around it. So, so that was me. So, 2005, we became a knight of the Anglican Church, a knight of St. Christopher. Um, uh, in, our, in our world, you're supposed to be a soldier of Christ. You defend the church and the community of, of believers. That's something I'm proud of. I also hold a traditional chief title. Uh, it's a jawbreaker. Um, it's called the Obongedenge Isingwa. Uh, and there's a bit to it. Obongedenge, where I come from, is the name or the description for the, the native peer when it is fully, fully uh, matured. The very black piece of it, and nothing to do with my complexion. Then uh, I started DJ right from secondary school, so I still have my musical speakers, my, my mixing machine, which I sometimes display in my sitting room or I have in my, my, my uh, car trunk. Uh, if I come to your party and the music is not very good, I take over the party. Uh, I start to play. But the trouble starts when I want to leave and your guests have gotten used to good quality music and sorry, I have to dismantle my equipment and get out of there. So, so I do that and I enjoy that. So I collect music, all genre, uh, and I, I enjoy that. I run marathons. Um, which is something I discovered on my 50th birthday. I was looking for something unique as a gift to myself. Uh, I'm bored by the things that people, a lot of people connect to. Uh, big parties to celebrate 50. I'm not saying those are bad, but they are. How much of those can you do? Destination event, photo shoot. Anybody could do that. So I was looking for something unique I could hold to and say, this is a remembrance of having made this journey to the 50th, a collection of my thanksgiving for everything, all the near misses, all the opportunities, and joining a running club in Lagos, rehearsing and training with my friends, and somebody offered us an opportunity to register for uh, the Athens Marathon in 2014. Uh, we made it all the way to Athens, and I did that. It's 42 kilometers. And I followed up with, I think, four other, five other marathons since after that. So um, I, I can call myself um, a strong runner, because it's not everybody that can do a 42 kilometer marathon. Um, I'm venturing into scuba diving now. That's something I, I, I'm still trying to understand what I'm doing. <laughs> because um, I don't come from a riverine environment, so the water is not my thing. Uh, but again, it's one of those things that define life. The sense of adventure, the sense of care for others, care for yourself, existing beyond yourself. So as I read the literature around scuba diving and all the technical things that go with it, I see again the definition of what life is. Now that's what the marathon does. Yeah, you prepare yourself for a marathon, you start, what you meet is obstacles, challenges, opportunities. How you go through that is your story. 
Um, so I see something in scuba diving which I am exploring at the moment. Um, what else do I do? I've said I, I sing in a church choir. Um, and of course, I have my very fulfilling career that I'm very proud of, which I've taken to, if you like, the end. And I'm ready to start off um, whatever life throws out. But with some control, because you can actually say what you want at this stage. Yeah. Wow. All right. Let's delve a bit into your corporate life, which you said you spent 30 years. I mean, to a millennial and a Gen Z, that's a whole number of it's years <laughs> to spend in one's career. What are the high points of your career? I mean, what experience would you not forget in a hurry that you'd be so willing to talk to the younger generations about? Share with us. I, I think, and, and that goes to the point about the millennials and the way they see things. Uh, things are in the here and now. Um, working for 30 years takes a bit of resilience. Um, it takes a bit of understanding that even if it's a day, at some point in the day, things don't go well. Um, so it's not about giving up or changing jobs. It's about how you apply yourself uh, to that unique circumstance and challenge and surmounting it and moving on. Yeah, uh, yeah, 30 years is a long time. I can't work in a place for 30 years. What makes you think that working in 30 places in 30 years is the answer? Uh, what is your grounding? What does that does that make you somebody that can actually be confronted with a challenge, deal with it and move on to the next? Or you meet a challenge, you run away, you move to the next one. Uh, are you hoping there's not going to be a challenge in that new environment? So making my way through a technical professional through Shell, uh, getting into middle level management up to the senior level is an achievement in itself because it doesn't come easy. Um, uh, being able to actually go on international assignments, uh, again, people take it for granted. At any point in time, we would have 1% of the total Shell population on global assignments. Uh, and it's a rigorous process for selection competition. Um, being able to join, you're offered your first job because you are just a graduate and you've gone through the um, probation period. And then thereafter, every other job is advertised, you apply, you go for an interview, and you're offered the job if you're the best candidate. That is, that is something unique. Uh, and I think you have to give it to a company like Shell. So there is a refreshing at every three, four, five years, depending on your tenure. Um, knowing that there's nothing like our set. There's nothing like our peerage. Your peerage and your set is defined in the context of the job you're doing at that moment in time. So I joined with you, for example, and we get our first graduate job. Thereafter, you can end up working for me, or I end up working for you. Because our next jobs and the next jobs and the next job is a function of how competitive we are, how developed we are, and how we take advantage of opportunities. And everybody understands it. It's not favoritism as it were, but it's a human system. So it's something I'm very proud of. And making it all the way um, to becoming a director and retiring uh, on my own terms. Yeah. Uh, so talking to young people is about, it's actually possible. And there's a narrative that unfortunately is is uh, pervasive in this country that everything is wrong. Um, oh, there are no jobs. But every year, top graduates get employed. Who are those people? Oh, they know people. No. I ran a recruitment exercise for an NPC in 2019 into 2020. And we recruited 1,050 graduates from across this country on merit. I ran it, I know. But that's not the narrative you hear on the road. Because you define your criteria up front. What does it take to qualify? Educational qualification, age, um, all the demographics and all of that. And you insist on it. And contrary to street um, uh, stories, you find out that there are very good graduates from all over this country, from the best schools in the world. But that's not what you hear on the streets. And some people end up listening to those stories, and it defines them and the opportunities up front. Oh, there are no jobs. 
they won't give it to me. I am not from the right tribe. I'm not. No, those things happen. That give yourself a chance until it happens to you. If it happened to Obin, that doesn't mean it can happen to you. Give yourself a chance. Be careful who is filling your cup. Mm. Mm. While speaking with you earlier, when you mentioned working to help fulfill um, a communal goal, there's a collective goal that we all have. But in these days of individuality shining, uh, it, it seems to be a bit old school. So would that really define what your values are? Sometimes these things become stereotyped. People need to give you the right answers. Uh, for me, I, I've, I've over the years defined my values in terms of one word, positivity. Uh, and you can add all manner of things into it because you, you can't be reasonably positive if you, are not, if you don't have integrity, if you're not honest, uh, if you're not authentic, if you are not compassionate. Uh, compassionate is very important. Seeing yourself and what, seeing other people in terms of yourself. Being able to feel what other people feel. And that, that leads to the point you make. Yeah? The corporate world is cutthroat. It's a pyramid. Um, one person will be MD. You will be two. No matter how good you are. Um, so those of us who do talent management and succession management, we understand that for a healthy organization, you must have three, four, five people who are ready to take the top job at any point in time. That is what we call the, the um, succession matrix. Uh, any healthy organization is a minimum three to one. For any critical position, you must have three people in that organization who are good enough to take on that post tomorrow. If the incumbent moves on, something happens to you. So that already defines that one out of three of you will get that job. The three people can be friends, can be three of us here. Uh, so I know that I am in the association chart for the MD's role, but the only competition I have is Messi, my very good friend. In that environment, it's Messi or myself. I need to win. So I will do everything legitimately possible to beat Messi, for lack of a better word to do. Now, the conversation starts outside of that. You've gotten to that job. Must you live your life like that? What are you using that job to do? Are you creating value that is beyond yourself? Is it just about yourself? And that's where the old school thing comes in. Uh, my background has helped me to see life beyond myself. And so it's difficult to also judge people because you don't know their life experiences. Um, and so I know very, very clearly that any opportunity I have is not necessarily about me. Because you look around, you ask yourself, how many people were qualified for this opportunity? How many people may have even worked harder than yourself? So why you? Um, that should tell you that maybe you have actually been given a platform to do more. For people around. That's the sense of community. So it, for me, it's not counter today's world, uh, but it's just about how you spin the narrative, how you how you how you do the message the messaging that you can actually compete and be the best as an individual, but you can also use your being the best to serve the common good. Mm. You've served and you've retired in the corporate world, you engaged in all the things. I think it takes a level of support from other people for you to be able to live your life to the fullest. So what would you say or who would you pinpoint as a support system? Uh, I think my family is, is, is critical and, and if you notice in the course of this conversation I've always made reference to them. Um, it's a live wire. Uh, knowing that yeah, I'm out there I'm dealing with all the odds, but there's always this this share group um, that are supportive, that will back me up, that will provide all the whatever. Uh, it helps uh, from my parents to my siblings to my immediate family. Uh, that has been very critical to everything I've achieved. I've also been lucky to have friends, very great friends, people who have gone beyond being friends to actually becoming family and brothers. 
and sisters. Um, and I'm not talking about the crowd, the usual, um, everybody's friend. Uh, I have, over time, managed to be in a crowd and be alone. In a crowd of 20 people, everybody is screaming and shouting. Only three, four people actually are your real friends. Uh, those friends have always come up uh, because that's where you find your mirror. Those are not dancing to the gallery. They don't care your position. They don't care what you have. They can look you in the face and say, you've messed up here. I've needed them all my life. I've relied on them. I've benefited from them. That always happens. You may not see us every day, but they are always there. One message, this is what's going on. They know how to respond to you. Yeah, so I've benefited um, from that. And um, this is something that's creeping into my conversation as I get older. Uh, because sometimes we take it for granted. You begin to think it's about you and your effort and your bravery, your brilliance. There is something bigger than us in everything we do. There is there is a power that determines our everyday in spite of ourselves. So when I talk about my support system, my faith in the Almighty is becoming more crystal. Because I've had opportunity to reflect on the journey, on the several things that could have gone wrong that I had no impact on. And they turned out. Um, so yeah, that's my support structure. And um Earlier, you talked about your father being your role model. How so? Yeah, um, role model. People always look for some fantastic figure uh, who is on you know, the global, global uh, platform. Um, fantastic biographies and stuff. My role model is my father. Um, because everything I've turned out to be, uh, I've learned from him. Um, he's messaging right from childhood. Uh, his discipline, very tough at some stage. Um, he's making you understand that uh, being disciplined sometimes can be inconvenient. Inconvenience, yeah? uh, being able to swim against the tide, saying no when everybody is saying yes because you believe. Uh, but these things can cost you things, but at the end of the day, um, you are better off. I learned all of that from him. Uh, and I still, when I look back, and I thank God for the privilege of keeping him alive up till now, so that I can actually say thank you, which is what we did um, on the 28th of December last year. Um, just to look back and say, well done, sir. Um, the sacrifice, when a man has opportunity of just living large and is able to sacrifice all of that to give his children, his family, the future, that doesn't come easy. So I don't need to look outside for a role model. She defined it for me. If I can be like that man, and I choose my words carefully, if I can, because I'm not yet like him. There are sacrifices he made that I'll still struggle with. Opportunity costs. Can you give up this for this? He was able to give all of that. And today he sits back almost 40 years after retirement and he's having the best of the world. There's no better lesson. Let's speak about something that's a bit related to age. I mean, at 58, you wake up in the morning to go about to doing what you need to do. Do you still have goals despite everything you've accomplished in life? Yeah, when life, when life ceases to have aspirations, I think it's over. Um, maybe not goals in the specific uh, way they are described of I want to do X, Y, Z. I think it's about um, uh, being grateful for my journey and now looking for a platform and an opportunity um, for public service to give back, um, to support people who require support. A lot of people require support. Um, as a talent manager, uh, you come across individuals who are just doing their best. They don't have the benefit of somebody providing some guidance. Uh, and I can I can extrapolate that to the wider world. And I say, if this is happening in this organization of 5,000 people, that's exactly what's going on in the world. So you, you can sit back and judge people 
they could, should have done this. They needed to do this. But they don't know. Most times people are doing the best they can based on their experience, their knowledge, their education, and the guidance they have been provided with. I see a massive opportunity for people like me, for myself, in that space. I know what good looks like. Thank God for the career I had and my world experience. Um, so, knowing that the journey between point A and B, B being good, is what I'm familiar with. And in many respects, I see people struggling in, at point A, managing to get to two. And people saying, it's okay. But there is seven, there's eight, there's nine. I see a massive role for me there. Uh, so this whole thing is about understanding that, yes, you've had a good career, fine in many respects in Shell, but you can no longer continue to be holding that Shell man. Um, there is an opportunity now, there's a time to just say, that is over. Take advantage of all of that and create this new person who is, be, who is going to be in a position to help, create, um, additional support structure for individuals who don't have anything to do with their company uh, and provide public service at whatever level. Uh, so that's what this is about. So, to get so let's dwell a bit on leadership matters. Um, a lot of people, both in the international community, I even locally say Nigeria is bereft of good leaders. I mean, you, uh, with, your, with, your, with your experiences, you can correct that particular notion. If you had in one way, an opportunity, that platform to create a change in Nigeria and you get an audience with President Muhammad Pari of Nigeria. What problem would you look at at the base level and what solution would you give to that problem that would create a ripple effect to solving other problems as well? Okay, so, so I'll use an analogy from my world, which is talent. Yeah, um, Most times people look at appointments at the senior level. Ah, this person has gotten this job. This is good. I believe, and by my experience, if you want to attack attack that top structure, start from the recruitment. There's no magic. If you pay attention to the inflow of people, and if you can influence the people that come in, sit back with good structures in between. Fifteen years down the road, you see them emerge at the top. If you don't pay attention at that level, the top level will continue to surprise you. Where does that lead us to? Our educational system has failed us. Um, we've dropped the ball, from my view. Uh, you have the privilege of interviewing graduates. They have all manner of qualifications, first class, second class, but there's no content. Now, I'm not talking about whether they studied engineering or philosophy or for No, no. It's about what does education do to you? Does it broaden your mind? Does it give you the latitude to think? Does it expand your aptitude to see the wood from the trees? That's what foundational education is, in my view. Uh, so if you don't get it right at that level, uh, you're going to have people who define things in the context of here and now. The kind of things we're looking at in this country cannot be solved by are long-term things. Uh, so people have to be willing, to be patient, but not patient and complacent, patient and working at things. Yeah. So if I have a one-on-one, -on -one, a direct opportunity to speak to um, the president of this country, it's about how do we create the next generation of talent leaders, of leaders, and it's education. You have to correct it. There's no halfway. If you take somebody who has studied overseas and somebody who has, they may have the same degree. If you set an exam, the guy who has studied in Nigeria may beat the person that studied abroad. But that is paper. When you come to an organization and you begin to ask people to, this is the outcome I want. Think through and get me a solution. That's where you see the difference. And you follow my thinking. Think through and get me an outcome. Define results and allow people to think on each other. Not, I give you this, you do it, excellent. I give you this, you do it. That's, that's, that's our problem. Yeah, people take on a road, they are not ready for it. It's not their fault. 
So they do it knee-jerk. They don't think things through. They don't see the connection between what they do, what they don't do, and the next, and the next, and the next. It's all about that education. The selfish, the political, those, those things are add-ons. Because the education disciplines you. Let's, let's, let's also put it that way. Uh, so, yeah. So let's take a lesson from some of the other things you do that's outside of the corporate life. Let's draw a lesson from your sporting activities, marathon. What life lesson or lessons can one take from that, do I call it endurance sport? <laughs> yeah, Le lessons from, from running marathons. One of them is resilience. There is nothing in this world that comes easy. The marathon teaches you that. Ah, what do I mean? You spend months training for this thing. Part of your rehearsal, you do 30 kilometers. You feel good. I'm ready. You do 36. You're ready. And you can also liken that to your education. It's called preparation. We all prepare in different ways. And then on your mat set go, that morning, 10,000 people come out. In that park, there are professional runners. That is their day job. And that's talking about objective. How do you define your life objective? For that professional runner, his objective is to win the prize. One, two, three, there's cash. Or set a world record. On your mask, set go, boom. Kenya, Ethiopia, you see them, they take off. But you're also there. <laughs> what does success mean for you? If you don't come in first, second, third, fourth, does it mean you have failed? It's possible. If you have defined success in terms of winning that prize, you see portions of this in everything we do. People join organization, they define success in being empty. Are you sure that that's the right thing to do? Or is it about happiness, fulfillment, achievement? My first marathon, my target was to finish. Define. Within six hours, because at six, the sixth hour, they will close that gate. All of that effort, you will have no medal. So my target was to come in, in within the six hours and come back with a medal. I achieved it in four hours, 28 minutes. Great. The guy who won the marathon, as far as I'm concerned, I don't care who he is. I won. Because somebody actually, when I was celebrating, somebody said, did you win? I said, yes, I won. Because I have defined what success is. So you can see this in life. It's a rat race. Everybody starts. 42 kilometers is a long journey. There are things that are propelling individuals that you're not aware of. At the ten, um, first kilometer, some people are taking off very fast. That's how they train. Or they have. Um, some drinks they have been told to drink that keep them energy. You don't know. You follow them. In two minutes, two kilometers, you're out. They are still going. <laughs> Who tells you? I mean, we have even in the, in the family of five, six, we all come differently prepared. We have ate the same food. We've lived in the same house, but we all come differently prepared. So the moment life starts, you must accept who you are. Prepare yourself and take every challenge as yours. That also allows you the liberty not to be driven by somebody's narrative. In fact, when you were speaking about the person that collapsed before it gets to the two kilometers, I just raised up my hand to that. <laughs> that was me. It was real. Like for example, the person who actually took us on this journey, um, she didn't finish that race. Because she fell ill at the two, because she took off. No. Very experienced runner, had done 10 kilometers, yeah, 10 marathons. At about 25 k's, she got the shivers, which can happen to any runner. Yeah, God. Bandage, you know, blankets and all of that. And again, another big lesson. 
we see her, we stop to see what's going on. She said, no, run your own race. Run your own race. You can see that in life. Um, life is a potpourri of the serious and the not so serious. So let's delve to the not so serious side of life. Um, what else do you do when you're not running, you're not, you know, doing your thought leadership thingy, talking to people, giving advice and the rest of them? What else do you do you know, to catch fun? <laughs> I told you I'm a DJ. Uh, there's so much you can do in the world of music. Um, I, 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 love, I love my band. Um, I collect all my own spirits. Uh, and not just not just collect them. I actually pay attention to why they are. Again, it's a balance between play and seriousness. Yeah? Um, uh, because I, I take interest, I try to study these things. Uh, and I read, I read quite a bit, uh, which helps me to also understand how people think and what is important to, to, to people. Um, uh, in the old days, I would go to clubbing. Um, we're, we're, we're old now. Uh, at some at some point in your career, it became essentially dangerous to be seen in certain places. <laughs> yeah, uh, because what you do becomes a reflection of the company you represent. So we drop some of that. But I, I have a way of catching money uh, in many ways that a lot of people may may think is fun. You know, somebody you tell somebody you read a book that's fun. You won't know what you're talking about. Um, but um, that during COVID, for example. I was in Abuja. I was alone in my flat. Um, but I, my days were full because between my audio book, my DJ equipment, and my bar, I had so much to do. I discovered so many things in that period. And also because I write, um, I could actually reflect on stuff. There's, there's, there is a journey I started during that period which I'm actually very proud of. Uh, because I sang in a, a church choir in Port Harcourt many years ago. And we've had we have a platform uh, on WhatsApp um, because people were bored and looking for what to do. One one of our elder people said, "Look, you know, why don't you begin to share a psalm every Sunday? I know you can read psalms, analyze them, get into the mind of the writer, and choose a particular musical setting and share it." So it started as a joke, uh, and I started doing it. There are 150 psalms. I started doing one psalm every Sunday and sending to this group. The audience has continued to grow. As of last week, we were at Psalm 130. Tomorrow will be Psalm 131. That's 131 Sundays non-stop. I think about that, I said, I said, tell myself, hmm, this requires discipline. That I need to, like, tomorrow, 131, I've read it once. I've read it the second time. I'm trying to understand it. I do some research. I choose the music every week for 131 weeks. And I'm praying to God that nothing stops this until I hit 150, uh, which is the last time. Um, yeah, those kind of things, they are play for me. They are fun. Uh, um, um, aside, um, aside uh, what's it called? The other things you've done, I know it's already late to call you a priest. So I was wondering, do you have an ambition of becoming a pastor? So... One thing I didn't tell you, um, initially, that I don't like, I hate uh, motivational speakers. They talk a lot of rubbish, they mm. copy and paste things that they can't relate to. Um, there's a kind of pastoring that I like. It's not creating, giving the impression that the world is all nice and easy. It's magic. You do this, you get this. It gets trust very intellectually, very demeaning for me. So when you say I want to be a pastor, my mind goes and it scares me. But I'm, I'm, I'm fundamentally a teacher. So what do pastors do? What's priesthood? It's teaching, helping people to understand some way. I am born into that that, that uh, tradition of teaching. I did a lot of that also in my career. But when you're doing talent management, talent development, coaching, mentoring, you are teaching, you're sharing experiences, you're giving people options. I can't run away from teaching. I don't want to call it pastoring. Yeah? 
Uh, but you know how these things work. People say they have been called. Yes. Um, my, my nearest example of being called is Moses in the Bible. He never wanted that job. First of all, he was a stammerer. He wasn't given to public speaking. He was on his own. I thought, you would do this work. He said, no, no, I'm not capable. And he was equipped to do it because he was called. So if at any point in time I am called, I know I'll be equipped. I don't need to think about it. So when you say you are called and you are struggling, you're asking people to, no, you are not called. Go and look for something to do. You, you just want to do something. Uh, I will remain a teacher. And it speaks to the things we've spoken about, giving back. It's about creating the next generation of people. I enjoy it. It comes naturally to me. Uh, if that means using scripture to teach, call it pastoring, call it whatever, it works. So it's usual for women to ask women, what's the secret of their beauty? I'm not going to ask you the secret of your beauty. I'm going to ask you the secret of your youthfulness. <laughs> uh, is there a secret? Let me, let me say I'm blessed. Um, it's difficult not to recognize that there's something in our family. But I don't take it for granted. Uh, my father is 102, 103 this year, October, by God's grace. Um, his elder brother died at 110. Um, so yeah, there must be something there. Uh, but I also work at it. Because I have people, my, my, my younger brothers coming here, you can actually call them my senior. So it's not automatic that because you're, um, I've, 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 uh, I try to live a life that is pattern. I don't eat everything. Again, that's another side of me. Um, because also, I, mean, I hold a traditional title. I'll go into a party and the whole world eating and looking at you. I will not. It's not, it doesn't mean I'm not, I'm not hungry. I will watch it. I will sit down there. And when I get home and I'm dying of hunger, I learned that one from my dad also. Because he told us, when you go to the public, detest your best food. It's in dignity, there's character, People go, who is this guy? Mm. So, watching what you eat in and out is part of it. And if you listen to my story, I also try to do my bit. Uh, you know, back in the days, if you're not sure of a subject in, a, in, in school, um, you're not sure, you can do well. Uh, the night before the exam, go to class, let everybody see you. So that when you fail, they say, but he tried. <laughs> And we saw him in class. I mean, it's not like don't mind him; he didn't even show up. So, to to, to that extent, um, watching what I eat, trying to work out. I use the gym a lot. I have a personal trainer in Abuja. Uh, I run. I, I, I you do all of these things as much as you can. That is uh, doing your own bit. It doesn't guarantee longevity. Longevity for 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 all practical purposes, um, but. That is, you're satisfied that you did your bit. You, you made a contribution to your well-being. I'm proud of how I look at 58. I am actually desirous to keep it that way. Um, and I'm actually very, very, very happy to tell people I'm retired. They look at you and they retire. I say, yes, yes, I'm a pensioner. Ah. Um, how do we call it in linear language now? Funky pensioner or something? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, to wrap it I up. I live on a pension. <laughs> <laughs> to wrap it up, um, let's talk about. There's one thing EBN stands for, apart from enjoying, trying as much as possible to enjoy the very little things of life. We um, hammer so much on embracing your culture, your roots, and you mentioned that you have a traditional title. Talk to us about how that helps you, you know, connect to your roots. I'm, I'm very big on my culture and my home, um, where I come from. Um, so it was easy for me to accept the traditional title. Um, because I, in everything I do, there's something that my sense of right and wrong is actually from there, before religion. Because those traditional societies, particularly my own, they were very clear on what you could do and what you could not do. That comes from there. 
um, the sense of community is from there. Um, the sense of your success is defined in the context of all of us. It's, it's, it's called the, the weakest link. You know, the weakest link determines how strong this link is. is uh, the chair, the chair is. So my culture. Uh, recently, we decided to revive our traditional masquerade because uh, a lot of people don't understand religion. Uh, so they think religion is either or. They think it's, it's one or the other. Uh, for me, religion is about our finding our way to God. Uh, I do not denigrate our traditional African worship by any stretch. And the, group, the older I get, the more I see the value and the way they held society together. Uh, and I see the things we've lost because we moved away too far. I'm not also not um, uh, saying the, the new ways are wrong. Uh, so we decided to recreate our traditional masquerade. Because from a large standpoint, it's actually something that brought all of us together. That it was a sense of ownership. We own this thing. And let me tell you why it's important. As you go into public life, the analogy I'll use is the knowledge of analogy of a masquerade. We all sit in this room and we decide that we're going to dance a masquerade. Yeah? We decide that you are going to wear the, the face of the masquerade. These persons will play the drums. And because of the character of the masquerade, when we go out there, you will run after people, the spectators, and try to flog them. My job is to pull you back. That's part of the show. And we agree, we dress you up, we go out. The moment you go out there, and instead of chasing the crowd, you start chasing those of us who help you to feel you are failed. That's when we'll tell you that we've, we actually put this masquerade on you. How do you relate that to society? If people who hold public office recognize that they're actually holding it in trust for the people that sent them there. They'll behave differently. And it is our traditional institutions that are much, you know, very well equipped to make that happen. Because society is open. The moment we come into Lagos, Abuja, we are general people. So that concept of representation, that this masquerade is a representation of us. Therefore, we should not hurt us. And I don't know whether you understand the, the depth of the analogy here. It helps people to be more responsible. I think it helps people to be actually be more caring uh, and, and more, more selfless. And so you do everything if you like chase the, 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 the problems outside. They look after your, your people. If everybody understands that concept, at the end of the day, everybody looks after everybody. So I, I think you can fall that. All right. Um, it's been a wholesome conversation, eye-opening. Um, is there anything else that you want to tell us that we haven't touched on yet? Um, I see my experience as unique. I also believe and I think there are other people like me who have had very unique experiences, who are sitting back in different corners of this country and wondering, how do I stay here? I think the media has a role. People like your individuals, you have a role to find a platform for these voices to come out. People are scared. And frankly, it's not easy. If you have had encounters with active politicians, if you have if you've had an opportunity of sharing your views with the first thing that you see is they don't want you close by because they know you have a narrative that can change the way they do things. But with a lot of support, uh, and the media is powerful, frankly, very powerful. Uh, people can create a story and leave it there, it becomes a story, even when nothing happens. So I, I think I am lucky to have this opportunity, and I'm looking forward to the outcome. But I'm also using that as uh, an opportunity to plead for, if you like, a search. Uh, I was lucky to meet um, yourselves and say, oh, can you share the opportunity? I say, oh, wow, we can do this. There are many people who may not have had access to um, uh, 
this, this kind of uh, conversations that need them to. I know my colleagues who know quite a lot, they can change things. Uh, but they were small, the number is small, so we need to build a coalition and we need to get into the public space and hopefully begin to drive and drag everybody towards the future that we are all desiring. Thank you.